Welcome to part 12 of this Davon Data tutorial series, a Python crash course. The topic of this video is writing your own functions. Think of functions as a way of bundling your Python code for ease of reuse. You will be writing functions often when you use Python for analytics and data science. For example, you will often use functions to help clean data before you can analyze it. As always, please follow along with this video by typing the code that I type. Don't hesitate to pause or rewind the video if you need to, because you learn Python by writing Python. Per the usual in this crash course, I have created a brand new Jupyter Notebook, which I have called Functions, and set up some cells here, plus the markdown, including a subsection for introducing functions. So here's the thing, you're really familiar with functions by now. For example, here's a function we've been using a lot throughout this crash course, it's the print function. Like, so I can print hello world. If you're a nerd, you know this is a pretty classic thing to do in programming. The print function exists in Python. Somebody actually wrote the raw code to make this work. Even though it's pretty simple, it simply displays whatever you pass to the print function in the cell, there's still code behind it. There's still magic. There's still some goodness there. We just don't happen to see it. All we do is say, look, we want to reuse the print function over and over again, and we just pass it different parameters or different arguments. In this case, what I'm passing to it is a string, hello world. You can define your own functions. And in fact, there are two primary ways for you to bundle up your code into reusable chunks of functionality. The first of which is functions, which we've seen a lot so far. The second of which is classes. And we've seen that just a little bit of classes so far. We saw the int class, the string class, the float class, so on and so forth. Soon we're going to be working with something called pandas. Pandas is the library that allows you to work with entire tables of data in Python, and you'll be doing a lot with classes from the Pandas library pretty soon in this crash course. But for right now, we're going to focus on bundling up your code into reusable chunks using functions. So let's say that we want to do something silly. And as you know, that's pretty common in this tutorial series. So we can define our own functions. So let's say that I am going to create my print function. This is how I can do it. I use the keyword def here. That tells Python I want to define a function. And Python says, OK, totally cool, Dave. What do you want to name the function? So I'm calling it my print right here. And then I also need to define whether or not my function takes in parameters, takes in arguments. Now, obviously, if I'm going to create some sort of duplicate of the print function, I need to be able to take in at least one parameter, one argument, the thing that I'm going to print. So as we've seen in previous lessons with loops, you need to indent your code to make sure that Python understands how much of the code is actually associated with your function versus not with your function. So if I hit enter, notice how Jupyter Notebook automatically indents my cursor here. And what I can do is I can say, hey, look, you know what? Why reinvent the wheel? I'm going to use the existing print function in my print. Now, remember, I promised you this was a silly example. <laughs> here you go. So I've got a function. Now, if I return back to the far left in terms of indentation, I can then type some code. I can actually invoke, I can call my new function, my print, and I can say, pass it in, hello world, the string. And if I run this, it works exactly like you would expect. But notice there's a lot going on here. We can define our functions. They have names, they have parameter lists, they have code. And in Python, a function is actually an object behind the scenes. So there is now literally in my Jupyter Notebook space, an object called myPrint, which Python knows is a function that takes a single argument. And I can call that object and do things with it, like pass it strings for it to print out. Or I could do something like this, 87, voila. Again, a contrived example, but we're definitely crawling here with the functions. Now we can actually do more than just this. You can have your functions perform work and then return back the results of that work. So let's see how that works here. No pun intended. <laughs> functions do work and can return stuff. And I'll quote that stuff. So let's say I'm going to create another silly function just to prove my point here, where I'm going to define a function and I'm going to call it multiply by seven. Now notice that the naming convention here in Python is pretty similar to your variable names. While you can call your functions almost anything you want, typically they're logical words, all lowercase, separated by underscores. That's a very common naming convention in Python. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take in a number. 
because if my function multiplies things by seven, it makes sense for me to take in a parameter. And also if I name the parameter num, it kind of is self-documenting code. This function expects a number to be taken in as opposed to a string, for example. I hit enter and then I can use the return keyword. The return keyword says, look, after everything is done at the very last part, the very last step of this function's execution, return back something. So I could do this, for example, num times seven. I can also do this. This is also valid. So maybe I create a variable called return val that equals num times seven, and then I return back return val. Both of these work exactly the same. The first one that I showed you tends to be more Pythonic because it's more compact, it's more succinct, but technically from the computer's perspective, it doesn't really matter. So now I can do things like, I'm gonna create a variable called my num, which stores the return value from multiply by seven, and I'm gonna pass in three, and then I can of course spit that out. Oh, notice what I did here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Fix that. Okay, now it says multiply by seven. And if I run that, it works just fine. It's exactly what we'd expect. So next up, we can ask ourselves this. What does the print function, the built-in print function in Python return? Because what we just saw was multiply by seven returns back a value multiplied by seven. What does the print function return? So let's just check that out with code. We can always experiment with Python to find out what's going on. Notice what I'm doing here. I'm calling the built-in print function. I'm passing in the string hello world. And then I'm saying, look, whatever return value comes back from print, go ahead and stick it in this object that I'm calling print return, this variable I'm calling print return. So I can do this. And then I, of course I can print, um, or I can do type. Now, if I run this, here's what you get. Notice that print return actually comes back with none. So if I print print return, it actually says none. And then when I ask for the type, it says none type. And that is the representation of an absence of value in Python. So the print function doesn't return anything. And none type represents this idea of nothingness. And this is what we would expect. Why would the print function return back anything? So when we do something like that, all we get back is the none type. Now none type is also a object, it's a class. It represents something in Python. Everything in Python is a class. I said that in the very beginning of the course. This is a prime example of that. Even the absence of value has a class type known as none type. So let's do something really funky here. Let's just prove to you that the none type is the absence of value. So if I do this, print return plus one. So I'm trying to add one to the representation of nothingness. <laughs> so in theory, this should not work. So if I run this, sure enough, we get a error, an exception, a type error, which says, Dave, dude, you can't do this. There is no functionality for adding an integer to a none type. And that's exactly what we would expect. Okay, moving on. Let's talk a little bit more about function parameters. So let me set up my markdown here. Function parameters. So first up, functions can contain zero, one, or many parameters. So let's define a function here. Actually, let's put a comment in first. A function with multiple parameters. So I'm gonna define my function and I'm gonna call it combine strings. And it's gonna have string one as a parameter, string two as a second parameter, and separator as a third parameter. This is totally legal. So now we can implement this function's code. So we're gonna return string one plus the separator plus string two. Once again, another contrived silly example, but it illustrates the point here. And then I can now call my function with hello, comma, space world, and then space as my separator. And when I do this, I get back what you would expect. So this example shows how you can use multiple parameters in your functions. You can actually get a lot more fancy than this, but that's pretty advanced stuff and beyond the scope of what you do most of the time in analytics and data science. You're mostly writing your functions like this. Imagine that we're gonna be using this combined strings function again. And what happens when I forget the last parameter? So combine strings, and I'm gonna do hello, comma, and world. Now notice what happens here. 
Python says, whoa, whoa, Dave, wait a second. The definition of combined strings requires three parameters and you only gave me two. And notice here, it gives you a type error and it says, look, you're using this wrong. And it specifically says, look, you're missing the separator argument, the separator parameter. Now there's a way to actually get around this. If you really want to consider separator, this third parameter for the combined strings function as being optional, we can set it up to have a default value. And let's see how we can do that. Yeah, parameter value, let's call it that. Notice what I've done here. I'm redefining combined strings now. I'm changing the object, the function object that used to be combined strings to now read. It takes three parameters, the third of which has a default value of an empty string. Now, this is super important. This is a string that happens to be empty. Think of it like a jar in your house without anything in it. The string exists, it just doesn't contain anything. This is different than a null or a none type. An empty string is not the same thing as a none type. And then of course we can return str1 plus separator plus str2. And then now we can call combined strings, the new one, with hello, comma, and world. Oh, and I forgot my exclamation point before. Let's go ahead and throw that back in. And now we can see here that everything works just fine because it just says, look, I'm going to use the default value of separator because Dave didn't provide it and it's an empty string. So everything just gets crammed together. Okay, next up. So one of the cool things about naming your parameters is that it gives you a lot of flexibility when you call your functions using keyword parameters. So let's go ahead and redefine combined strings as str1, str to separator with a default. And now we're gonna add something funky here. We're gonna add another one called message. And this is a contrived example, but it's gonna illustrate what I'm talking about here. So let's add in some logic. So your functions can do complicated things. Any arbitrary level of complexity can be built into your functions. You can mix and match all the different code constructs that you've learned throughout the course to define how your functions do work. So as an example, I can use an if statement here. So if message is not equal to the default value, because notice the default value is an empty string, I can then say, print the message. Otherwise, return back, and if you want to, you can always add a line of white space in there. Return back str1 plus separator plus str2. Now here's the thing. We can pass everything into combined strings without using the names as long as everything that we pass into the function matches up. So for example, if I do this, oh geez, sorry about that. Okay, four. Notice that what'll end up happening is one will get mapped to str1, two will get mapped to str2, three will get mapped to separator, and four will get mapped to message. This works just fine. Everything works great. So my message is four, it gets printed out, and then one, three, two is then returned. We can use the name parameters if we would like. So for example, I can do hello world. Oops, look at that. That's bad, Dave. <laughs> you gotta use those single quotes. So I have hello world. And here's the thing, because separator has a default value, I don't have to pass it in if I don't want to, but let's say I do want to have a message. So what I can do is just say, hey, look, make the message parameter equal to the value of message. And if I run this, notice everything works just fine. Hello world is crammed together because separator is just the default value of an empty string, but I have specified that message is message, and that works all just fine. Now, what's really cool is, as long as I'm using the names of the parameters, I can do pretty much whatever I want. So what I'm gonna do here is actually, I'm gonna copy this line of code real quick so I don't have to type it in again. And then named parameters come after positional parameter. So I can cut the, paste this in like this, and I can then say separator equals a space. And notice that these are actually changed from the original order. So separator and then message, message and separator. Python doesn't care. If as long as you're using the names, everything works just fine. So if I run this code, I get back message, hello space world. Now notice, of course, I don't have to do this, but I can. This is also 100% legal works just the same. Now, if I get really kooky and if I do this, notice, of course, things get changed around exactly what we would expect. I don't like that. So let's go ahead and get rid of that stuff. But I just wanted to show you that positional parameters are implied when they don't have the actual parameter names. 
And then if you use the argument names, you can do whatever you want. You can mix and match in any sort of order. Okay, moving on. So the last thing that we need to talk about in this particular lesson is variable scope. This is a very important concept. So far, we have been using variables throughout this course that have what are known as global scope. So this variable has global scope. My string is equal to my string. <laughs> and I can print my string. And I can run it. And then I can use my string in this cell down here because it's in the global scope and it works just fine. All that is awesome. What ends up happening is that when you use variables inside of your functions, they have different levels of scope. So just to really make this clear, crystal clear about global versus local scope, let's do something funky. So functions can access global variables. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and define print my string, another silly function to be sure. And this function is not gonna take any parameters. And it's just gonna call the built-in print function and then print out the global variable. Okay, I actually need to invoke it. Hello, Dave. Here we go, Let's call the function, Dave. There we go. <laughs> because notice that this is in the global scope. It's available everywhere inside my Jupyter Notebook. Now let's compare this to another situation. Functions can have local variables. So let's change this up a little bit. And notice what's gonna happen, what's happening here. We know that I have a variable at the global scope level called my string. We see this right here, right? It's up here. It's in the global scope. But I, but I can totally define a function and call a parameter my underscore string, and Python will say, look, there are actually two instances, there are actually two versions, if you will, of my underscore string. There is the global version, and then there is the local version that only exists in the context of this particular function. So if I do this, print my string, and I say another string, print whoop, my string, look at that. Proof positive that there, in fact, there are two versions of my underscore string. One at the global level, which is this one right here, and then at the local level, which is only, only exists in the context of this particular function. So that's super important to understand, is that you have local scope and global scope. So let's really bring this home with another example here. Functions can have local variables. So I can print my string, and I can define a variable inside of the function that only exists for the execution of the function. It's created when the function starts, and it's destroyed when the function ends. And I can, once again, call this my string, and this will be local scope, and then I can call print my string. And not surprisingly, if I call print my string the function, versus printing my string, which is the global variable, <laughs> we get exactly what we'd expect. So this is really super important to understand. I know I'm kind of pounding on this a little bit, but this is really important to understand. You have to have global variables and local variables. You need to keep them straight. Okay, last thing for this particular lesson that we want to talk about for functions. Global variables can be changed by functions. So this is why this is super important. So I'm going to define a list object, an empty list called my list. This is global. And then I can then define a function called append stuff. And notice what it's doing here. It's accessing that global variable and then appending a string value to it. And then let me run this. And sure enough, we can see here that in fact, we have changed the global variable my list was changed inside of the function. So this is super important because if you don't keep track of what's going on, you might get unintended results. And there you go. That is enough to get us started with functions. So be sure to save this notebook because we won't be using it again because we're gonna be talking about a different topic in the next video, which is lambdas. And you can think of lambdas in Python as essentially as many functions. And what you'll find is that when you're working with Python and analytics and data science, you often use lambdas instead of full-blown functions. And when it's ready, I'll go ahead and put the tile up here so you can go ahead and click on it. So until next time, please stay healthy, and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.